This week on Money Matters, up and running, a network of 17 creative economy innovation centers are now in full swing, providing a new paradigm for economic growth. Startups in the country, how many and on what scale are they contributing to growth potential here in Korea? Startups in numbers. If you're a fan of a pro sports team, we'll show you how their love for your favorite game translates into support for the local economy. What stories matter in Asia? We'll look at the changing landscape of business in Korea and the rest of Asia on Money Matters. Hello everyone, I'm Kim Il-sun, your new host for Money Matters. Each week, I'll bring you in-depth news, analysis, and commentary for our viewers in Asia and around the world. Let's first start off with our top headlines with Sami Sorang. A slowdown in the global economy, a stronger dollar, and a plunge in commodities all combined have left emerging economies with a fierce uphill battle. Investors continued their mass exodus, dumping a net $15 billion from emerging market equity funds over the last three weeks in July. As the U.S. Federal Reserve signaled it would keep on track with a rate hike later in the year, and China's stock market continued to wobble, losing more than 14 percent last month, the downward spiral for emerging markets continues. Currencies in these economies have slumped to 15-year lows, with Brazil, Russia and Colombia suffering due to the sell-off in commodities. Meanwhile, in Asia, China's stock market saw another rough stretch in the last week of July, pushing other Asian indices into mixed territory. Stocks rebounded, edging up 3.5 percent last Wednesday, on the back of hopes that Beijing will be able to calm the swinging market. Korea's main Kospi closed just above the 2030 mark, down 0.77 percent, following an earnings shock from record losses by the country's three largest shipbuilders. In Japan, the Nikkei saw a gain of 1.4 percent in the month of July, the only index to end up at month end, excluding Australia and New Zealand. More signs that the global oil glut may continue as American oil producers are putting more drilling rigs to work along with greater than anticipated production from the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. July oil prices fell to a fresh multi-month low, sliding roughly 21 percent, the worst since October 2008. Oil field services firm Baker Hughes reported the oil rig count in the U.S. climbed by 5 to 664 last week, adding to the 20 rig jump from the previous week. As of the end of July, U.S. crude closed down 2.89 percent at $47 a barrel. And a fierce battle for ownership has broken out at Korea's largest retail giant Lotte Group as the two sons of founder Shin Gyo Koo are scrambling to gain the upper hand in the Korea and Japan-based business. In a series of dramatic events, the founder was demoted to honorary chairman by his second oldest son, Dong Bin, while his older brother, Dong Ju, was ousted. Lotte Group affiliates in Korea, run by the younger Shin, reported a combined revenue of $70 billion in 2013, while the Japan operation, managed by his brother, stood at $4.8 billion. The power struggle has been characterized as emblematic of problems within Korea's family-owned conglomerates. Korea has recorded a current account surplus in June, continuing its surplus streak now for a record-long 40 months. According to the Bank of Korea, the country ran a 12.2 billion US dollar account surplus, up more than 40 percent from the previous month. It also posted a record-high $52.4 billion in the first half of this year. But analysts worry that the figures reflect a slowing exports and even slower imports as outbound shipments fell about 2 percent on year in June, while inbound shipments nosedived 17 percent. The backbone of the Park Geun Hye administration's economic growth policy has been driven by the bid to build a creative economy. The most notable achievement so far is a network of 17 innovation centers that have opened up across the nation. These centers play a key role in providing growth for small and mid-sized businesses and boosting the local economy. With all of them now up and running, we took a look at how they will help fire up growth in a new direction. 창의적 아이디어를 가진 창업 벤처 기업은 대기업으로부터 실질적인 도움을 받을 수가 있고 
대기업 입장에서도 상생 경제에 기여하는 윈윈의 관계가 형성될 수 있을 것입니다. Building a creative economy has been the key drive behind the Bakunin administration's economic policy. Since the president took office, the creative economy has stirred up new waves of change within the business sector. A creative economy refers to an economic paradigm that steps away from capital and labor-based growth models and centers around creative ideas and information communication technology. Korea's drive to build the creative economy stems from the belief that the new markets create new jobs, and this in turn leads to greater economic growth. At the heart of this all are the innovation centers that are designed to put the creative economy into motion. There are 17 of these innovation centers nationwide, built in conjunction with private companies that are targeting region-specific projects. There are a total of 16 big businesses, including Samsung, Hyundai Motor, and Tucson, that have taken part in these centers so far. Based on the large companies and their regional characteristics, these centers operate in different fields, such as ICT, automobiles, shipbuilding, and trade. Starting with the center in Daejeon, which kicked off in September, now 17 centers are up and running, together with small and mid-sized firms, and offer education for startup firms and even mentor college students with budding business ideas. At the center in Incheon, known as the western port city of the country, work is on the way to provide aid for small firms looking to export their goods to China. Using its proximity to the neighboring market, the center is attracting small companies that can team up with technology-based logistics programs to break into China's online shopping industry. 중국하고도 지리적으로 가장 가깝습니다. 인천이 우리나라의 벤처나 중소기업들이 대중국 진출을 원활히 하도록 지원하는 역할을 하게 되었습니다. 우리나라 벤처 중소기업들이 대중국 진출 그리고 특히 중국 온라인 시장에 맞춤형으로 지원할 수 진출할 수 있도록 온라인 보부상 인상 육성 프로그램을 실행하고 있습니다. After the first center opened last September, the string of innovation hubs has been attracting a growing number of foreign governments, businesses, and investors. Everyone from the government to private enterprise to, you know, non-profits to uh, graduates and employees and individuals in Korean society and how all the goals are very much aligned um, to try and develop the creative economy. So far, 250 new startups and 125 small firms have received investment worth of $25 million, generating revenue of roughly $14.6 million. Behind this drive is the Ministry of Science, ICT, and Future Planning, which devises policies and strategies for continued growth. 축의 센터는 어떤 의미에서 거점이라고 볼수 있고 거점을 중심으로 창업을 위한 카페라든지 이런 것들이 굉장히 중요합니다. 그런 것들이 많이 될수 있도록 저희가 여건을 마련하고 지금은 모든 사업이나 산업이 시작부터 글로벌한 감각을 갖고 글로벌한 시장을 목표로 이제 출발을 하게 됩니다. 그래서 글로벌 시장과 글로벌 혁신가들과의 연계를 혁신센터를 통해 살수 있도록 그런 부분에 중점을 두고 추진할 계획입니다. Google Campus Seoul is another good example of efforts being made to build up a global startup network. Back in May, President Park Geun-hye visited the opening ceremony of Asia's first Google campus and shared her vision to write a new history of the creative economy by offering the best startup support service in the world. I'm very glad to see that uh, the, the current President Park's administration put so much of invest, huge investments on these big initiatives by uh, creating those 17 or more uh, creative economy centers. Uh, we have never seen this kind of uh, big investment in other countries. I think this is very unique and one of kind. In order to see such positive effects, what are some of the most important strategies that can not only help startup support centers, but also the greater Korean economy? Well, it is all about network. Uh, as a being a uh, startup CEO, uh, if I were, then um, you know, we, I cannot just uh, neglect those government and the big companies uh, when I do the business. 
So it is very critical to do uh, to make more networks and then try to find out uh, those opportunities uh, among them. Coming up at the end of this month is the Creative Economy Innovation Festivals that will center around the existing network of 17 innovation hubs. The season hopes to dig up young talents and stir up a startup boom. Hopes are this will also lead to more opportunities that translate into growth overseas. Under the Park Geun-hye administration, one major theme that we've been hearing about is the creative economy. Within the many economic policies of Korea, the creative economy is seen as one to lead the nation to a stronger future. And as a result, we're seeing a second boom in startups. Today on In Numbers, we'll be getting a closer look at the startup market of Korea. Now with the push to build a creative economy, startups now represent an essential part of Korea's overall economy. As of April this year, there were over 30,000 startup firms in the country with investments in all different fields, including research and development, but especially data processing, which also includes information and communication. In May of 2013, the government released a five-year plan to foster a creative economy ecosystem within Korea. Over 40 trillion won was dedicated to bringing about a new economy full of tech companies and startups and two years down the line, we've seen tremendous growth. In fact, investment has jumped from $591 billion to $818 billion. That's a rough 38% increase in startup investments. And within Asia, compared to our neighbors, how does Korea fare? Well, China has for a few years now been one of the fastest growing economies in the world. China's market for mergers and acquisitions and initial public offerings is very active. While Japan, on the other hand, has a very high number of applications for patents. And also, it seems that IP royalties have been steadily increasing over time, giving startups a greater incentive. Now, Korea, similarly, is seeing a high level of patent applications. But also, like we saw earlier, the country has a lot of venture capital development on the playing field. And with about two years down now, we'll have to wait and see what more is accomplished through the remaining years. That's it for today's In Numbers. Stay tuned for more inside and information on the economy of Korea and the rest of Asia. Trends in business evolve rapidly by the day, and we have some of the most interesting stories lined up from Asia. Let's get a close look at what they are. Known as one of the largest venture capital investors in the world, Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund, Timasek, and one of Facebook's co-founders, Eduardo Saverin, are just a couple of the huge forces within the startup industry of Singapore. According to Bloomberg, within Southeast Asia, Tomasek Group and Eduardo Saverin have invested huge sums of money into Golden Gate Ventures, a venture capital firm with offices located in Singapore. And this isn't the first time that the region has seen an influx of capital flooding into the startup market. According to KPMG and CB Insight, venture capital in Asia in the second quarter amounted to $10.1 billion. That's a 45% spike from the same time last year. In other words, one-third of the world's venture capital is flowing into Asia. It looks like many of the luxury brands are moving out of China and now heading towards Japan. But why? Originally, 30% of luxury goods were consumed by Chinese. But the Chinese government has put in regulations limiting the amount of luxury goods that can be purchased by individuals. The result? Well, many are flocking to nearby Japan to do the rest of their luxury goods shopping. And also at the number of Japanese households with assets of more than 100 million yen, which is roughly 80.7 million US dollars, expected to reach 1 million, these brands are hoping to see consumption skyrocket. In fact, Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy Group, reported revenue increases of more than 34% for the first half of this year in Japan. As the population of youth in Japan dwindles, 
Part-time wages have risen to 1,000 yen an hour, or roughly $8. For KFCs located in central Japan, the average hourly wage has even surpassed the 1,000 yen mark. The reason for this constant increase in hourly wage is because of the lack of young workers, as the country faces a continually aging society. Those in their 20s account for 40% of the part-time employment population. But the number of young workers in that age bracket is down 30% compared to 20 years ago. While Japanese companies may be seeking to add extra hires on their payroll, on the back of Abenomics, for now, experts predict that the economy will continue to suffer from the labor shortage. A Korean toy company has announced some exciting news. It's making its way into France's toy market. Starting from this month, the popular transforming robots, Dobots, will start airing on French animation channels for four months. And come mid-September, you'll be able to see Tobots toys on the shelves of toy stores in the country. But this isn't the first alliance between Korean and French partners. In 2012, Robocar Poli laid the ground for Korean animation and toys in France, which turned out to be a huge hit. The reason why toy producers in Korea are eyeing new markets is to create a better experience for children in hopes that it will lead to consumption of their products. It could be a great chance for children elsewhere to start enjoying some of Korea's most beloved characters. The luxury brands at department stores, banks, and convenience stores all sit on the first floor of buildings. But in apartments, the most favored royal floors are those ranging from the 10th to 12th. But this dynamic has started to change, a lot of it having to do with the climbing rent. These royal floors are usually more expensive than others, so many are avoiding these heftier price tags and choosing to pay less for different floors. These changes have brought about some unusual effects. People initially thought they were choosing a less desirable floor, but instead, residents have been much more satisfied with their so-called second-choice options. The conventionally unpopular floors in apartment buildings were the first and top floors, but families with children are enjoying the ground level because they don't need to worry about disturbing their neighbors. And for those who don't want to be disturbed, top floors are becoming more sought-out options. Professional teams for sports like soccer, baseball, volleyball, and so on all have a home city that they are based in. Behind each team, there's a city and a sponsor company. So, it's easy to think of them as simply sponsors and benefactors. But there's much more to the relationship. So, Ms. Rang joins us for more. That's right, definitely not as simple. For example, residents of the host city naturally become fans of the team and go to watch the games. They also become familiar with the sponsor company and the firm benefits from this increased visibility. So these three elements, the sports team, the host city and the parent company all work together to further the sports industry. I went to look into two teams and the relationship they have with their home city. From a quiet town that saw its demise after the fall of the steel industry, to the UK's national city of sport. From an industrial city to the home of one of world's most loved sports, soccer. And from a small city to the center of American football. Sports is the common denominator behind the success of all these cities. Local governments in Korea are zeroing in on sports marketing as well. By owning a professional sports team, they can expect revenue first from ticket sales, second from food and related merchandise, and third from ads within the stadium. At the base camp of a professional volleyball team, 100 die-hard fans and team players are gathered under one roof. They're here for the annual summer camp, which is in its 12th year now. Fans will spend the next two days mingling with their favorite sports stars. Fans are always coming to the camp, and we're here for the summer camp, and we're here for the summer camp, and we're here for the summer camp. 
Based in Cheonan city of Chungcheongbuk-do province, the Skywalkers were founded in 2001, and currently the team has around 4,000 supporters. In 2013, construction of its so-called castle further strengthened bonding between the team and local residents. The $24 million building acts not only as a base camp, but as a hub for interaction between the athletes and their fans. The team is also active in supporting the creation of a local youth volleyball team and in sponsoring the city's sitting volleyball team. 그 구단이 가지고 있는 다양한 재능과 컨텐츠들을 천안 시민들 간 함께 하려고 노력을 하고 있습니다. 다이어트 배구 교실을 연다든지 그 외에 저희 외국인 용병 선수들과 함께 가서 외국 외국어 교실, 영어 교실을 진행하기도 했고요. In 2010, the four major pro leagues in Korea were estimated to have an economic impact worth 1.9 billion dollars. Volleyball is said to account for 60 million dollars, basketball for 160 million, soccer for 660 million, and baseball for over 850 million dollars in added value. For example, in the case of baseball, the pro league is responsible for employing around 12,000 workers. Even on a hot weekday evening, there is a long line of fans waiting to watch a baseball game. The stadium's home team is the Gwangju Kia Tigers. Thousands of local residents as well as fans from the opposing team SK Wyverts have turned up. 인천에서 광주까지 KTX 타고 왔는데요. 오늘 꼭 SK가 이어서 좋은 모습 보고 싶어 SK 화이팅. 우리 SK 야구 보러 인천에서 미리 내려와서 하루 자고요. 오늘 직관하러 광주에 여기 들렀습니다. Kia Tigers is owned by Kia Motors, which operates a large automobile manufacturing plant in the city. In turn, Kia Motors benefits from improved brand image and visibility that goes hand in hand with the team's success. 2014년 광주 기아 챔피언스 필드에서는 총 62경기가 펼쳐졌고 약 64만 명의 관중이 입장을 하였습니다. 그래서 한 경기가 펼쳐지는 동안 300여 개 이상의 일자리가 창출이 되고 있고 지역민들이 오셔서 다양한 문화 활동을 즐길 수 있는 집안 시설을 마련을 하려고 노력을 하고 있습니다. For the local government, its profitability from sports marketing is largely dependent on whether it has a large modern stadium. To this effect, the Gwangju Metropolitan City built a new 22,000-seat stadium last year, in addition to its existing arena. The in order to reap the full benefits from a costly stadium, local governments also host international sports events. The city of Gwangju estimates the recent Gwangju Summer University created 20,000 jobs and a production value of $1.6 billion. To make a successful sports city, local government should be supportive to franchises. In Korea, the stadium agreement term is short-term basis. Without long-term basis, the sports franchise cannot make long-term schedule. Professional franchises need to make exciting things, satisfying services. If fans are satisfied with their services, they may come again to come back to the stadium. In that way, the stadium are full with the fans. So, Mr. Rang, from the city's point of view, what are the benefits uh, do cities gain from owning a professional sports team? Well, aside from creating new jobs and generating income through games and other sports events, residents can enjoy access to premium sports facilities and new leisure activities. And with the number of pro league spectators growing steadily in recent years, especially in baseball, there's potential for pro sports to become a significant source of income for local economies. 
Well, I also hear that there is a concern that um, these teams, uh, uh, some of them are, uh, maybe too dependent on these sponsored companies. What's the story on that? That's right. And this is because companies, they generally fund a much greater proportion than the local governments do. So teams are naturally more influenced by the parent company than the home city. And because teams follow the company, there have even been cases where teams have actually moved their home cities. There are very few professional sports teams in Korea that can survive on their own without the financial backing from a business. But above all, for the pro sports industry in Korea to grow further, the most important aspect is to make sure that the games can continually draw in a wider audience. Well, that was a very interesting story. Thank you for your report, Ms. Orang. My pleasure. That's all we have on Money Matters. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll bring you plenty of stories as they unfold in Asia, give you a view of the changing landscape of business in the region. I'm Kim Il-sun. Thanks for watching.